morning. Good morning. This morning I'd like to talk to you about, boy that sounds like it's loud. No? I'd like to talk to you about death. <clears throat> you know, when the, uh, the Buddha went out on his quest to find out why there was so much unhappiness in the world, uh, when he finally uh, had his awakening, he talked about uh, essentially impermanence, but he didn't call it impermanence. He originally talked about um, people are unhappy because they have to deal with uh, the aging process, getting old. Uh, they had to deal with uh, sickness, and ultimately they had to deal with death, and all of that is about impermanence. Um, up until the age of, I don't know, 65, 66, um, I never really was sick. I mean, I had a cold and a flu like everybody else did, but I was never sick. And as we all know here, then I had my great adventure into the hospital. And uh, <clears throat> so I got to see illness. And of course, the thing about illness is that uh, the only way you can really deal with it is to accept it. There is a natural human tendency to want to resist. We have an idea that if we resist illness, somehow we will conquer it. And uh, th that would be nice if it worked. You know, then we wouldn't need doctors and, and healers and healthcare professionals and hospitals and medicines and because we could just decide to be well and then everything would work fine. And there are religious traditions that actually believe that. They believe if you, if you believe enough, everything will be just hunky-dory. Uh, doesn't ever work out, but that's what they believe. The issue of, Ill, of old age, of course, I've talked about that many times. All you have to do is walk into any drugstore and start looking at the variety of things they have to help you not age. And now on uh, television, they have channels where they sell things, and in those channels they, uh, they have shows. I recorded one, I haven't watched it yet, but it's about uh, women never getting old. I just happened to see that uh, come up and I thought, well, I'll record that and see what that's all about, you know. What's the magic there? And there was this old woman explaining to people that, uh, you know, you didn't need to get old. She looked awful old to me, but, uh, but then again, I look kind of old to me once in a while when I look in the mirror now. I, I've, I've gone over a little hump there. I used to look in the mirror and I always saw this young guy. Now the young guy is just inside my head. When I look in the mirror, it's kind of startling. Um, and then death. And uh, as everyone that comes to this temple on a regular basis knows, we've had, within a year's time, we had quite a few deaths here, uh, which caused us to, one, have to deal with the grief. The last one being uh, Reverend Tom High, who uh, died through an accident. And uh, so we have to deal with the grief, but by the same token, we have to deal with um, it wasn't expected. That death truly was not expected. Uh, when uh, Reverend Suhita and Reverend uh, Karuna passed away, they were both old. So it wasn't necessarily expected. Suhita was supposed to be here that day and spend about a week with us. And he had a heart attack and he was gone. But he was also old. So it wasn't a, a huge surprise. And there wasn't really a lot of grief associated with it because of that. But when we have young people, it's so hard, I think, just because we don't expect it. And the great death we don't expect is ours. Because, of course, we'll live forever and ever and ever. Um, I was at dinner with some friends last night, and uh, they're two or three or four years older than me. And uh, she had, has a heart condition, and she had to have some uh, work done on her heart. And they went through her wrist. And it used to be they went through their leg, which I find phenomenal. 
instead of, I had a friend when I was young who had this enormous scar on his chest where they had opened his chest up to repair his heart. And then, then when they started going through the big artery in the leg, I thought, boy, wow. And of course, people can get up and move around and do things real quickly because of that. And now they're going through the arm, and I guess that's even less invasive. And uh, so you have people that are able to do lots of wonderful things. And my comment was, you know, they say that if we live long enough, medical science will learn how to fix almost anything. So I said, if we live long enough, we'll live forever. Yeah, which is a, another fantasy. You know, it means that we'll never step in front of a bus. You know, we'll never take a great fall. There'll never be another disease that comes along. It's like the measles now. You know, I had measles when I was a kid, and then we eradicated it, and here comes a brand new strain. And we just want to conquer old age and illness and death so bad because we think that then everything will be wonderful, we'll be happy. And I think about the people that are parentally unhappy. And we all know some people that are unhappy all the time. They never smile. They always have something sarcastic to say. They always are looking on the gloomy side. And I'm thinking, why would those people want to live forever? And why would we want to live with them forever? You know, because they just never get happy. Well, I'm thought, I, I, I think of the Buddha. And the Buddha, one of the things the Buddha had to deal with was in the first couple of years, if we can call it his ministry, a Western notion, but uh, I was reading some uh, St. Uh, Benedictine newsletter that I get every couple of months. Suko started getting it. And uh, <clears throat> they talk about all the different ministries they had. And uh, I thought of Susan. I, li I really liked the newsletter. Suko really never looked at it very much. She just go, one day she went, oh, I know that none, because she went and spent a couple weeks with him. And then she threw it away. And I read it from cover to cover. And it's all full of death. You got, you know, there was, yeah. Uh, Sister Boo, that was really her name, mm -hmm. passed away and she was a, a little over 100. So in, in the little thing, they have all the nuns that are passing away. And fortunately, they have some nuns that are coming in. And, um, and there's a reason I started talking about them. But that's one of those old moments. So uh, the Buddha had, to, had a lot of people that were basically older with him, that were studying with him, and co-travelers. And I mentioned them last week, that it was just probably an accident that the Buddha was the first one to wake up. Doesn't change the fact that he was the first one to wake up, but one of these other guys could have done it, and then he would have been their student. And, but about two years into this, uh, all the ascetics who were wandering around in the forest, they'd come to the Buddha and he was teaching them. And many of them became awakened. And, and then there were the princes of the realm. And they were coming to the Buddha. And a lot of them he was related to uh, because, of course, he was a prince of the realm. And they were not generally not kids. They were middle-aged like the Buddha. And then we have what we're left with, which are the kids. And he had lots of kids. And ultimately, he had lots of rules because these kids, you know, they, he would say, don't do this. And they'd go, okay. And then they'd find another thing to do they weren't supposed to do. And he said, well, don't do that. You know, and anybody that's ever raised children or taught children or been around children, uh, it's just, and the, and the rules just multiply. And uh, I started to say something about ministry, and it came back to me. If I wait, I've learned that if I wait, it's like trying to remember a name. I just to forget about it and wait for uh, 30 seconds, and it'll come to me. And there was a nun in there they were talking about, and, uh, and I was reading her uh, biography. And these, these nuns are phenomenal. You know, Mary, I think you could appreciate it. I think of you when I read something like that. All of these nuns were highly educated. They were teaching order. 
So when you read about a nun, you read about the life of a nun, uh, it talks about, well, she went to this college and then she had the calling and she decided to be a nun and she went in and she worked with the kindergarten children and then she did this and then she went back for her master's. Uh, Sister Boo had a PhD. A lot of them did. And I thought, you know, this is the best kept secret in the whole world, Catholic. Uh, I always think of monks. I never say, I, monks is not a boy term to me. Monks is somebody who is in training. That's what it always means to me. And nun always sounds Catholic and people get confused. So I, I try never to use the term nun. And I think to, to them, to me, they're all monks. They live the same life as the monks. But they were so incredibly educated and they were out there teaching college and high school and this and that and everything and doing all these things. And as they grew older, there was a great lesson there because they became less capable of doing these things. But I thought of this, I thought of you, Mary, when I was a couple of days ago when I was reading this because here are women that don't need to prove anything. You know, they're just, they're so bright and so educated and they're, they're, functioning all the time. They just don't have time to argue with anybody about anything. They're just so busy being who they are. And then as they get older, they can't do that anymore. So they take lighter jobs and lighter jobs and lighter jobs. And But every job is a ministry. You know, of course, we know that the old nun teaches a new nun, so she becomes uh, in charge of novices. And Sister Boo, uh, towards the end of her life had crippling arthritis and that's why I thought of Mary because she wrote in her diary that her new ministry was pain and she went and worked with the sisters they, they had a place within the monastery where the sisters needed to be cared for uh, we would call it assisted living and they would take care of them and she went and worked with the sisters who were in pain because of her vast knowledge of pain. Now that's a very positive way to approach illness and that's a positive way to approach the aging process because when I was young people would complain about their legs hurt, we do meditation, we did intense meditation, lots of hours of meditation and they would complain about their back and their legs and the this and the that and I go what are you going to do when you get old? And I wasn't old, but you know, I've been around, we've all been around old people, and I thought, well, really? You think you're going to feel like this the rest of your life? No, you're going to hit a point where, and I hit it a long time ago, every morning when you get up, you take an inventory of the aches and pains, you know? And that's just, that's just part of the aging process. So we have the Buddha, he had to deal with these young people, and he came up with all different kinds of techniques to introduce them to the notion of one, impermanence. That no matter how good you feel, things will pass. No matter how much you're capable of doing, you'll be, as time goes by, capable of doing less and less and less. And this has been my experience in the last few years, is that I'm, I estimate I'm about a third as strong as I, I was four or five years ago because of that illness. And it's, I, I think everything's come back that's going to come back. Uh, enough time has passed now that, okay, this is what I've got. So then I have to accept this. And a woman came to the Buddha and was lamenting and crying and gnashing her teeth and pulling her hair and said, I've lost my only child. You must do something. Now, in the realm of religion, it doesn't matter what religion it is, there is a notion of miracles. And I'm always kind of, it always makes me want to laugh a little bit that the justification for the, for the person that started a religion, I don't want to name any particular religion, but almost universally the person that started the religion was able to do miracles. In other words, they were a magician. And so they could, uh, you know, wave their hand and make something happen or they could do a special ceremony and make something happen. And within Buddhism, people want that, of course, because to them, this somehow this is what holy is. Of course, that's not what holy is at all. Holy surrounds us. We just are blind to the fact that we're surrounded by things that are holy. 
uh, every tree and every plant and every rock and every person and everything that exists in the universe is holy. But it's very hard for us to understand that because we want something extraordinary. Someone that dies quietly is holy. The enlightened masters have a history of predicting their death. And very often they would call their students around and say, okay, I'm going to leave you. Come on in here and say goodbye. And then they, they maybe give their last talk or they, they recite their death poem, which is very common. Or they simply smile and they sit down and they're gone. And of course, that's your last great lesson. And the Buddha did the same thing. So this woman comes and she goes, oh, and she's crying and carrying on. And I, I've lost my only child. And, the, and she says, you have to do something. Please bring him back to life. Because what am I going to do? I have no one to take care of me in my old age. Of course, in America, we don't think that way because we, we know what to do with old people, right? There's always some place to shove them so we don't have to deal with them. And so he said, I want you to go and uh, collect mustard seeds for me. And if you've never seen a mustard seed, they're very, very small. He said, but I want you to, he gave her a bag. He said, I want you to take this bag and I want you to collect mustard seeds. I want you to go to each house in the village, good sized village, and ask them uh, if they've, if they've had no death in that house to give you a mustard seed. But if they've had a death in that house, then you have to pass on because you can't collect a mustard seed. So the woman spent the whole day going from house to house to house to house to house and came back to the Buddha in the evening with an empty bag. And she said, I could not find any place that death had not touched. And the Buddha just looked at her and said, do you understand now? And she wasn't real happy, but she no longer was lamenting the loss of her only son because this is what happens in life. So the Buddha went uh, to have lunch with a lay person, and the lay person was a blacksmith. That's what we would call him. Uh, the sutras, they talk about he's an ironmonger and all that, but he was a blacksmith, which means he was a highly skilled person. So he had money. And he invited the Buddha and all the disciples he wanted to bring to a lunch. And this is a very old Buddhist tradition. In the Orient, it's very common that people will invite monks, hint, hint, to their house for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then, of course, after the lunch, the, the head monk, whoever the head guy is, because there might be more than one monk, is expected to uh, give a little Dharma talk. Some other people from the meditation group we had to her house for lunch. And we got to the house, and I felt... I'd never really been invited to an oriental house to have. Well, actually I had, but I didn't realize it at the time. And so we sat down and they waited. And of course they wanted me to say grace. So I led them in our simple chant that we say before we have a meal. And we ate the meal and we got done. It was good food. Of course, I like to eat, so you can tell that. So that wasn't a problem. And we got done and then they sat and waited. And I thought, I bet I'm supposed to give a little talk. So I gave a little talk and, and everybody smiled and that was good and it was over with. So that was a normal thing. So this man invited the Buddha to come to his house the next day for a, a big feast. And they walked in and in the, in the sutras it says that uh, there was a large container of pig's delight. Now this is a great controversy in, in translation because Pig's Delight, even though Sanskrit is a fairly accurate, in Pali, they're fairly accurate, uh, we're not sure because one meaning could be the tender parts of the pig. So it could be the tender parts of the pig, so that's how we translate Pig's Delight. And remember that people gave meat to the monks back then. That was common practice. But also, it could mean truffles. You know how they use pigs to go out and find the mushrooms? Okay, so that was, that was another meaning of pig's delight. So to this day, nobody is sure whether 
there was a big bowl of pork or there was a big bowl of mushrooms. And the Buddhist looked at that bowl of mushrooms and realized, or pork, which are, because we really, you know, if you're vegetarian, you want it to be mushrooms. Right, Eric? <laughs> Absolutely, it was mushrooms. But if you're, you know, you're not vegetarian, only at the temple do you eat vegetarian, then you go, well, pork would be okay. That was something pretty popular to eat back then. So the Buddha looked at it and saw that it had started to spoil. And the person that was feeding everybody didn't realize that. And so the Buddha said to him, he said, you know, uh, today I'm just going to eat this. So reserve that just for me. And everybody else, all my disciples here, they can eat anything that you have set out on the table. And, and they were feasts. And I know exactly what the feasts were like because I went to Vietnamese temples for a number of years before I realized that the monks didn't always eat like that. Because they had everything in the world. You could not sample everything they would put out. And the ladies would come and cook for two or three days. And then I started visiting temples when it wasn't a holiday and found out we eat a lot of soup. And it just so happens that I love pho, so that was okay, you know. Um, so the Buddha ate the spoiled food. And afterwards, he told the, uh, the blacksmith, he said, I want you to take uh, what we have left here, and I want you to bury it. Because I think it's a little tainted. He was very gentle. And he said, I think it's a little tainted, so I want you to bury it. And, and make sure that nobody eats any of this. And then the Buddha was violently ill. And all you have to do is remember whenever you've had a little food poisoning, you know, what that was like. That's, it actually says that in the sutra. That's what happened with the Buddha. And he was so violently ill that he knew that uh, the end was near. He was 80 years old. Uh, most of his senior disciples had passed away. Uh, a, a lot of people that had been, when they first encountered the Buddha, who were children, had passed away. Eighty years old, 2,600 years ago, was really old. And so there was no problem there. But he started traveling back to an area that he was comfortable with. And as he went, he put the word out that he would like his disciples to gather around him. And uh, Donna, our wonderful artist that did this picture, is doing a picture for us. I don't, you probably haven't seen them. They were in the, in the Sangha Hall for a while. Uh, I mentioned that I wish we had a picture of the baby Buddha, a big picture to use, and we'll be using that this year, because she showed up one day, and she said that's the, the, the biggest thing I could get in my car. That's what determined how big the picture was. And then at the end of the summer, when we do the ceremony for the people who have passed away, she did a picture of a hungry ghost, kind of a scary picture, a very American artist kind of thing. She said she didn't want to just copy what was there. But uh, so they're behind the door in my room. So you can sneak a peek. And, and I, I have the baby Buddha there. The, the ghost is kind of scary, so I put that in the back. <laughs> but she's doing a picture of the Buddha's passing away for us. And we'll bring that out. And normally it's celebrated. It's, everybody doesn't pick the same date, but normally it's celebrated in November, at least in Japan, the passing of the Buddha. And it's a wonderful picture because in the sutra it talks about everybody came to see the Buddha. And so the monks in the picture, you see the Buddha laying on his side as he's getting ready to say goodbye. And he gave his last sermon. And you see the monks around him. And then you see the lay people around them. And then you realize kind of floating in the sky are all these gods, because the Hindus, you know, they've got lots of different varieties of ways of looking at God. They're really monotheists, but, but they say, well, this is one aspect and this is another aspect. And so they have all of this. And then as the picture, as you draw back, like you were in a, making a movie, you see the large animals and the small animals and everything's there. The insects, the bugs are there. And they've all come to witness the passing of the Buddha. He really prepared everybody for the fact that he was passing. And he told them many things. 
And a couple of them I want to share. He said to them, because as he traveled, he talked. And he repeated his talking. And we've been looking at the sutra a little bit in the morning on this day, on Sunday. He said, as long as you get together, and he's talking to monks now, but it also applies to lay people because in the beginning he talked about the Kalamas, which was simply a clan of people that lived in an area. Like he was a Shakya, that was his clan. And he said, as long as you meet on a regular basis and you talk to each other and you make decisions together, I'm paraphrasing, but that's exactly what he meant. As long as you meet together and you talk to each other and you make decisions together, you will prosper. And that's what he said to the monks. Now, I have to point out to you, because I think sometimes people think that uh, on one hand, I seem to be very, this is the way we're going to do it. And on the other hand, i very wishy-washy. Because I'll say to people, what do you think of this? What do you think? Should we paint it this color? Should we paint it that color? Should we do that over there? Should we do this? That is my way of talking to you. I don't want to be the only person that makes a decision. I told Mary's husband one time, I said, you know, I get really tired of asking myself for advice. It gets old around here. And I ask Rob all the time. If I never got Rob to drive another nail for me, when I'm going to do something, I ask Rob, Mary, I don't know if he tells you that, but I'll say, what do you think? This, this addition to our Dharma Hall is Rob's fault. <laughs> yeah, because I said, you know, this lady keeps pestering me. She thinks we need a bigger temple. And he said, well, why don't you do this? And I like the idea, but it was his idea. It wasn't my idea. I never crossed my mind to do that. And now that he's, you know, we've done this and it's done, I think that, you know, if we ever have too many monks around here, yuck, uh, our back porch on our sangha hall, I could turn that into two bedrooms just like this. The only thing that I would be supervising some monks doing it rather than me doing it the next time around. And I like that idea, folding chair, large glass, lemonade, and tell them how to do what they're doing. Um, so that uh, what we have is a democracy. And it doesn't seem like a democracy to some people. I watched Americans really resist their teacher when the teacher said, no, this is what we have to do. But, you know, we live in a wonderful democracy, no matter what problems we have in this country, it's still working. Contrary to, you know, the naysayers, it's still working. And we have this representative sort of democracy, but the bottom line is that when you have a group of people, somebody has to have the final say. And that's what the teacher is. It has nothing to do with wisdom, although we wish it did. You know, oh, he's the, he's the wise old teacher. No, I, I remember a friend of mine uh, that was a student of Tiamans. We were about the same age Dharma, in the Dharma. And he would get very frustrated because he'd say, well, Sudo's always got to be right. And I finally said to him, I said, you were never in the military, were you? I said, you, you know, the boss can come out and ask your opinion, but ultimately he has to make the decision. And if the decision is wrong, it's okay because we make mistakes. And if the decision is right, it doesn't mean that he was necessarily wiser than anybody else. Maybe he had good advisors that all gave him good advice, and he said, okay, that's the way we're going to go because this is the best way to do it. And I said, that's just the reality. Somebody has to say, okay, let's, let's paint it purple. Okay. People get, I think you must get tired of the, the colors of paint. Have you noticed I've started using brown and trim? That's, that's a big move for me. When you paint everything red and trim, it's so easy to figure out what color of paint to buy when you have to repaint. But now I have to make sure I hang. Matter of fact, the hardware store has that has two colors on file for our trim now. Because if you look out here when you go out, if you didn't notice it, I've used brown and I use it on our new storage building. So that's just the decision making. That's just the way it works. Tianan used to talk about during the summer training when he had to go up the way to teach. He had to go in front of not just the abbot, but the entire Sangha and ask permission to leave. 
because monks were not supposed to leave the temple during the training period. And uh, so, and the other thing the Buddha said, and it's interesting because I always think of Sanskrit as being very, very concise. And, and Pali follows in the footsteps of Sanskrit because it's a newer version of Sanskrit. Uh, the Buddha said, be an island to yourself. You know the famous poem. I think every high school graduation up until the last 20 years ago, somebody got up and said, no man is an island. Okay, but the Buddha said, be an island. And, or he said, be a light. Because the Sanskrit word can mean both. I know you're gonna ask, light and island don't sound anything alike, but that's in English. And in Sanskrit, they're not really sure what she was saying. But the implication is the same thing. Ultimately, you have to do it. Now, I bring up these two things. As the Buddha's dying, he says, talk to each other, communicate, make decisions together. And you're responsible for your spiritual growth. They kind of sound like they don't fit together. But spiritual growth is not a community activity. Supporting each other is a community activity. Okay? Uh, being there when people need somebody is a community activity. But only you can get up in the morning and do meditation. Nobody can get in your head and help you clear it out. Nobody can help you with your reflection. They can criticize, which is not always a very good thing because we get focusing on the wrong thing. And the thing we get focusing on a lot of times is I don't want to be criticized. And so then we miss the whole point of the thing. And so that's why good teachers try to be as gentle as they can when they tell a student they need to improve or something. Because otherwise, and the Buddha talked about that, that it's very important to learn how to help someone. And just saying, well, that's no good, doesn't quite do it. So we have these two, two ideas. You know, I've talked in the last few months about an older disciple of mine who has come up against the three great impermanences old age, sickness, and death. And he's not doing well. So I talk to you about death right now because Master Dogen talked about the practice and how we need to be always mindful and always practicing because we don't have any idea when death is going to come. It can be just around the corner. You know, I heard about someone I didn't particularly know very well, but I heard yesterday about them that they dropped dead at 54. So how old do you think you're going to be when you die? You don't have any way to know. You know what you would like, but you don't know when you're going to die. So you need to treat every moment as if it's your last moment. Now there's two ways to approach that. One is to get very cynical and unhappy about life. Yeah, that's what I'm encouraging you to do. And the other is, in to, is to enjoy every moment. You know, Budweiser Beer had a commercial, I think it was Budweiser or Coors, and it just drove me up the wall. And I was in my 20s, and it said, live for the day. And it showed guys getting drunk. And that really bothered me. Because I thought, okay, live for the day, absolutely. Getting drunk, no. That means that, you know, when you eat, no matter how simple your food is, enjoy every taste of that food. No matter how, how unhappy you are with your best friend, learn to let go and love that best friend for all their faults. Because this may be the only moment you have to do it. So you have to take advantage of every moment you have. And that's what live for the day means, because the Buddha said that. He says you have to live in the moment. This is what happiness is about. It has nothing to do with what you have. 
It has nothing to do with what you think you want. It has to do with this moment where you are. Yeah, boy. 